All right, so <clears throat> this is the pre-class video for class number 19, RPH 140 World Philosophies, um, Friday, July 30th. Okay, so we are going to do some more of Islam and we're going to do Islam and women will be the new material, but we'll start out with the Quran. It was on yesterday's post and as an attachment, um, but we'll talk about that. Before that though, I would like to point out some things about the syllabus that seem that students it just occurred to me they might not be reading the syllabus. Um, I did required texts. Krista Tippett, please order this. If you do not read all of the assignments in that book, you should just plain old flunk the class. But, um, you know, you have to tell me exactly which ones you read and which ones you didn't on the last day that everything is due, which is August 5th. World religions, order it. You must read Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam. If you do not, serious uh, knockdown to your grade. I mean, you can't just read outlines and get credit for a college class. <laughs> and then the justice men of women, you must read every chapter I assign related to each of the religions. This is the substance of the class. All right, so um, the general skills. So what I'm hoping by now, you know, and. Again, the, I hope that you are learning what the author intended to say, understanding the argument, using the theory to show how it can be applied to a problem or why that idea will fail to solve important issues, analyze what's missing, um, Analyze, synthesize different points of view. That's a biggie in this class. Linking the positions we read with um, arguments and theories from other RPH class or from other disciplines and uh, creating your own worldview. In respect to the quality of the papers, um, you have to have a clear thesis statement. All of that is on the paper grade worksheet. Um, communicate orally. Um, the content of the papers has to get more complex and creative. And so I did say about your comments about the readings, they also need to be uh, more complex and creative. You have to start synthesizing what we've said um, in respect to religion and philosophy. You. You, your worldview needs to include what you mean by reason, what you mean by faith, or your idea of flourishing. It can be some kind of Aristotelian idea of flourishing, or it can be some other view you bring with you or something you made up. But anyway, what's the goal of all of this? What is uh, meaning? What has meaning for you? And Caitlin specifically, I remember, brought that up in class yesterday um, in respect to the mission of lying. So you will demonstrate that you have intellectual honesty and that's um, hopefully becoming very obvious that religion is often used to, make, to be intellectually dishonest, to split reason and faith and talk about God in a way that often strikes me as it's you're just talking about yourself and so god is not a function of your ego or your power or your particular state of knowledge or ignorance um so i 
I would, you know, make sure you get a heads up about that. Um, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad were all humble, um, both humble in terms of their moral character and also in terms of what they know and what they don't know. Socrates was particularly uh, concerned with that. Commitment to truth. So I think that anybody who's committed to truth is going to start seeing the similarities between these religious traditions. Fair to opposing points of view, patience with complexity and ambiguity, and tolerance of reasoned dissent. If a person disagrees with you, but they have a lot of good reasons, it's very important because in some, the next issue, they probably agree with you or you can learn from their dissent because they will have brought up things you hadn't thought of. Especially they will have brought up things, uh, you'll be able to understand how other people think. Um, if other people do not think and do not want to think, then it's really hard to know what to do, how to communicate, how to build a bridge. Um, intercultural knowledge, um, we create the history, you create a personal history, you really create who you become, and also a cultural history. So you're gonna leave behind a legacy of what your generation did or didn't do. Um, and I'm very disappointed in my generation, but I encourage you to do better than we did. Uh, if you don't, or, you know, it's the, the price is gonna be much higher. Um, inter integrative learning, obviously we're integrating a lot of different aspects of life and culture being more reflective and deliberate about how you wanna live. I assume that you understand that. Make more informed decisions about ethical reasoning you want to use. Hopefully by now you can understand that that was one of the um, goals of this class. Be, make more informed choices about what kind of civic engagement they wanna focus on while they're in college and beyond, and it will have a more global perspective. So all of those things are brought up um, in the class. The strategy is to draw you out. And I think that's pretty obvious that we do that. Um, attendance is required according to Lyon. Um, and then if you have a reason to be absent, you need to notify me. And this is the way it works, right? So one unexcused, two unexcused, okay. So one day of class in this class is more than two unexcused absences. So uh, a number of you uh, have substantial unexcused absences. I have gotten messages about excused absences, that's fine. Um, and I probably won't, hold your feet to the fire this much. But if I do lower your grade by one third, due to absences, it's right in the syllabus, one third or two thirds, uh, the nature of the class. Um, all right, so I talked about that. Um, that was the process by which we went. Um, Okay, I talked about the post, it's 400 words. Um, yeah, at least 400 words. So I was more specific later on. And, you know, as the semester went on, I, I changed it to 400 words per day. So it moved up to 800 words. Um, but I put that on the assignment and I haven't, I don't remember grading anyone down for a number of words so far. Um, I would say if you are not handing them in until now, then it would be 400 words per class because it's so late. And there are a lot of very late posts. Um, the paper is due every Monday, right? I have, you know. And late papers, here are my policy. If it's two days late, if it's four days late, 
right? There are a lot of very, very late papers. If I stuck to my own rules, a lot of you would be in deep trouble. The, the main thing right now is that you must hand in all four papers, okay? That is always a necessary requirement. If you don't, that's enough. You haven't taken the class. Um, if you are considering taking more RPH, um, please keep a portfolio so that you can have a final senior exit interview. That's fun, you know, it honestly is. We have a, a lunch with the students and they talk about what they gained from our PH and then they can hear from each other. And it's really, a, it's a nice event. <laughs> not a lot of work, not sweating blood, just one final reflection. Um, this is how I calculated the time. The summer school version is substantially shorter than usual. Um, the honor code, we have issues with plagiarism. Um, I think you should, you know, be able to handle that. Um, I'm not super picky about it, but uh, if I think someone is making an egregious error, it's right here in the syllabus and in the student handbook. Um, yeah, nobody's gonna harass anybody, I don't think, when they're staring at a computer screen. So I haven't seen even any dirty looks or anything. So <laughs> we are past the date to drop with a W. So, um, all right. Um, okay, so let's go to the Quran. Well, let me go to the outline. And um, yeah, it is the sons of Abraham. Again, if I hear people thinking that they are somehow superior because they're ethnically Jewish or Muslim, or I mean, the only ethnic, well, maybe some of the Muslims think they're ethnic Muslims, I don't know. But mostly it's people just, converting or being born into these religions, somehow that makes them morally better. That is just from a philosopher's point of view, gag me, you know, um, because that is how religion is used to kill, to maim, to mar marginalize. It's the worst side of religion to think that somehow because of some accident of fate, or you're somehow you're morally superior for anything other than exercising the virtues. And anybody who is actually virtuous is not going to say that. They are going to know that virtue is as virtue does. You know, you don't talk about it, you do it. And you certainly are not self-righteous about anything that you didn't choose, that was just sort of chosen for you. Okay, Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. So think about the argument here. The argument is that um, the Jews were mandated by God, right? God's chosen people but they were going down hell, they were degenerating. And then the prophets would come, try to, try to redeem them. And then it got worse and Jesus came, right? As the ultimate redeemer. And supposedly that's it, like it's all over. But um, he died, he didn't get married, he didn't have kids, he didn't exercise any power. So. God sent Muhammad, the seal of the prophet. So his is the last one because he gives you the directions and he gives you the model, right? So um, he was orphaned and okay. So the difference between this one and the corruption, the corruption of Athens was the corruption of democracy. The corruption of uh, Jesus issue was the corruption of Judaism. Buddha's issue was the corruption of Islam. 
Confucius issue was the period of the warring states where it was just fear and uh, extreme violence, brutality. Um, and in Muhammad's time, there wasn't any official religion. It was just general chaos, ignorance, poverty, and uh, religion was animistic polytheism, any kind of stuff. So you'd have all these other booths selling you stuff and you'd have these various spiritual whatevers also selling you stuff and they would uh, magnify your fears and telling you they could cure you of your fears. That's sort of the, what happened in the decline of Hinduism. It became fatalism or the occult, right? The dark side. Okay, well, so this is how it was in Muhammad's time. There was a real need for some kind of spiritual direction. For, so a deliverer is someone who delivers people in a spiritual direction, whereas Jesus was a redeemer, right? Redeem the tradition, redeem humankind. Um, but there was no tradition to redeem for um, Muhammad because, again, he wasn't aware of Christianity at that time. This is the main, it's not about Christian versus Muslim. It's about corruption versus um, a much more sacred and moral way of life. Um, so Muhammad was disgusted by it. He was a caravan driver, his wife. Um, Allah was one of the deities who went to this retreat. I said all of this before, so we will just talk about it. Um, this is important. He didn't pander to people, right? He didn't say, I can perform miracles. So believe in me because I can perform miracles. I don't think Jesus wanted people to believe in him because of the miraculous. Jesus' point was love God, love your neighbor as yourselves, love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. I mean, he didn't emphasize that what you believe, he emphasized how you live, right? Same with Muhammad. He didn't inflate his own image, right? Uh, the miracle creation, okay. He reacted to the religious and political establishment, same as these other uh, icons of morality. Um, he had to escape, right? We have that same problem in the other, the other leaders. Okay, so let's go to the Quran. Muslims tend to read it literally, right? But, and why, I mean, it's, it's much more likely to be read literally than the Old and New Testament because it was given by the angel Gabriel to one guy, Muhammad. And so he's just, so obviously, if you, you could take that all literally, it's the voice of God via Gabriel and Muhammad. Whereas the, the Bible is so full of a million different books about, written a million different times. They didn't talk to each other. They just had an idea of God. So this one, you know, when you say taking the Bible literally, well, you can't because it contradicts itself. Um, but the Quran, you could. And so then you have to distinguish between the uncreated Quran, the one in your heart, the one that's truly spiritual, and then the one that gets written down, the black marks on white paper, that one can get manipulated and cor corrupted. Um, Let's see, they were partly corrupted. The Old and New Testament, the claim was they were partly corrupted. Um, okay. It doesn't have dramatic narrative. So you will see that when you read it. Um, it's just in the first person. Um, okay, so the Quran is directly doctrinal. Proclaims the unity omnipotence. Okay, so if God is all powerful, all knowing, blah, blah, 
then there can only be one of those, right? Suppose there's two gods. How would you tell the difference? Well, one of them has to lack a perfection of the other. Well, then they would be infinitely perfect. Or one of them has to have a defect. Nope. So if you define God as infinitely perfect, uh, sorry, there's only one of those. So Allah, God, the Brahmin, according to the definition, they have to be the same. Um, so then there is, you know, does this God speak to people or not, right? Hindu and Buddha, no. Uh, but um, in Islam and Christian, yes, except that, of course, that's where the black marks on white paper contradict, and that's where people go to war over that stuff. Um, all right. I did meet a lot of people in Indonesia and also in um, in Bang my the school in Bangladesh who have memorized a lot of the Quran. Um, the basic concepts, monotheism. Um, the Jewish version was limited. The Christian version versus the um, Islam, right? They disagree on whether God, Jesus was a pro the Messiah. I don't think it matters. I think how you live is what matters. And that's what Jesus thought too. Um, so Muslim think the parental images are too anthropomorphic. Um, okay, God's nature, vengeance, 17 citation, mercy, 192 citations. So um, the terrorists, right? When we associate Islam, if you do, with it's not, it is not faithful to the tradition or the Korean. Um, and if you say, well, there's a lot of war and a lot of violence in the tradition, well, I'm sorry, you know, look at Christianity. Be fair, fair to opposing points of view. Um, this, you know, this tendency to blame the other guy or to, you know, chalk up points and see it's, it's neither Muhammad nor Jesus nor any other same person is going to get caught up in that stuff. Um, all right. Human, okay. The, I think the greatest sin, this is interesting, is just that you forgot your divine origin and that you're not grateful, right? You lack thankfulness. Um, you lack appreciation of life. Uh, okay. The five pillars, we'll talk about that. I would like your reactions to the five pillars. Um, and I, if I have time to show my slides of Indonesia, the, they really do pray five times a day. And the, the, Call to prayer blares out on those speakers uh, five times a day. And the first time is about 4.30 in the morning. And boy, I did not like that. So somebody told me to bring earplugs and I did, right? It's after midnight right now and I'm up, you know, and I have my videos. I don't finish till 2 a.m. You can imagine how much I liked having something blare at me at 4.30. But, you know... They're dedicated. They put God first. And I have, you know, I have a lot of respect for that. How can you not respect it? They fast. They, you know, they do it. Um, let's see. I love the story of the night journey to heaven, where originally you were supposed to pray 50 times a day and <laughs> Muhammad kept making deals, you know, so people sent him, I think it was Muhammad up to God, not 50, please. Okay, 40, no, please, 30, 20, 10, five. Okay, five. <laughs> so yeah, um, 
when they pray, when they bend down and pray, that's repeating, uh, sort of imitating fetal position, the notion of rebirth. That's a big notion in Christianity. They give their assets, they fast, and they take a pilgrimage. So the man that I worked with in um, Indonesia was, he had taken a pilgrimage somewhere between the first time I saw him, 2012, and then when I went back and taught there again in 2017. Um, now, this is another big issue, social justice. This, you really need to realize that right now we're in this era of using religion as a weapon and not thinking about social justice. That is not the origin of these traditions. Jesus embraced the tax collector, the woman with five husbands, the, the Samaritan, which is someone who married a, a non-Jew. That's, you know, racist. That was completely out of bounds. It's like marrying outside, well, it's marrying outside your race, but it had a religious overtone to it. So yeah, Jesus was completely against class barriers. And so was Muhammad, and so was Confucius. <laughs> okay. and, um, advocated generosity. He wasn't against the profit motive, but he was against greed, right? Um, and this is important that in the Quran, a daughter inherits half of what her brothers inherited. That is huge because before that and in the culture around it, women are just property. It wouldn't occur to people that they had any rights or could inherit one dime, right? Or one whatever their kind of money is. Truly, it's um, that was radical. So it might sound like it's sexist, but compared to what was there, no. <laughs> and he was against tribalism. Tribalism was huge. Um, and so he had the, yeah, the charter of Medina where he gave the Jews and the Christians a right and protections under the law, amazingly progressive. He was against the abuse of women. He was, he was really progressive when it comes to women. Um, okay, brotherly and sisterly love. He permitted uh, more than one wife, but he each one had to be taken care of. She had to have her separate living quarters. And there were reasons why women, this needed to be the norm because otherwise there were men were dying in war. And so there weren't enough men to go around and women had no way of providing for themselves and their families did not want to provide for their daughters the rest of their life. So it would tend to turn into female infanticide, right? They would kill their baby daughters because if the only option is that you literally have to take care of them until, you know, your whole life, no, you know, <laughs> that's... Poverty really drives people to do crazy things. Um, marriage is sacred. Um, women have to give their consent. Divorce is only a last resort, but it's possible. This is not the stereotype we have. This is not what the Taliban thinks. Um, but another fascinating thing about my teaching in Asia University is that my students there really do tell me the whole story of Muhammad as um, promoting women's equality. And they have way more stuff to refer to than Houston Smith. Um, but they also know about the Taliban. I mean, a, a number of them, quite a few of them live under, live in Afghanistan. And they know that that's not real Islam. Um, let's see, okay. Interracial marriages, he allowed for that. That's incredible. <laughs> in, a, in a place where tribalism is the norm, 
he's really trying to break that down. It's like Gandhi trying to break down the untouchables and the caste system. Um, he had a just war theory, you know, there's appropriate ways to minimize the brutality in war, make sure, you know, it's a defensive war. So the just war theory in Islam is very, very similar to the just war theory in Christianity. Um, the rules for the war, the care for the unit treaties. Uh, so both Christianity and Islam have a very sophisticated uh, set of principles. Um, okay. All right. Um, the Sunnis and the Shia. So this among Muslims, this is the big deal. Okay. In Indonesia, most of the Muslims are Sunni. So that's not the big deal. But in the Mideast, the Shia are Iran, part of Iraq. Um, Let's see. I can't remember exactly. And then the main Sunnis are the Saudis because Mecca is located in Saudi Arabia. So, and they have a lot of oil. So, uh, but, so there's huge animosity between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And they are fighting for turf. <laughs> okay. Um, and then there's the mystics and in general the mystical traditions tend to be even more tolerant because it's not doctrinal right it's really all about your heart love mysticism um intuition and so okay where is islam going so this book was written a long time ago and i mean I don't apologize right, for assigning older books because then you can see, oh, these problems didn't start yesterday. They've been around a lot. You've inherited these problems because the people before you didn't fix them. <coughs> no, some, I mean, did they try to fix them? Did they try to pass something better to us? Or do they just kick the can down the road to the next generation? Well, it's problem. It's a problem. Um, yeah. Does religion have to be conservative? Can it be progressive? I think it always is progressive. Authentic religion. Every one of these leaders is progressive because they radically criticize the status quo because the status quo tends to be corrupt. You know, money corrupts, power corrupts, comfort. You're in your comfort zone. You don't want to be challenged, just like the Athenians. You want to believe you're the best. You want to believe we're different. We're special. And, and um, so I just like Martin Luther King, Socrates, when he says he's always making people uncomfortable. You always have to move forward. Is it possible to unite? You, it, it's absolutely necessary to unite reason and faith or else faith is going to justify any level of brutality and reason is going to be used to um, commit all sorts of horrible crimes. Like the Germans were extremely rational. You'd have to, you had to be a real high tech person to conduct the Holocaust, right? You literally had to get the trains to run on time and you had to make sure you had enough gas in the, in the ovens. I mean, it was awful, but it was extremely rational in the sense of science, technology. Um, so uniting reason and faith is absolute soapbox for me um, because of the dangers. And it was for our founders too, that's important. So then we have that. I talked about that last time, Keith Ellison and all that. Um, ah, the Quran. So I have these excerpts from the Quran. 
Um, you don't have to read all of them. I would, um, I just can't believe how bad this is. And so I guess I will read this to you because it is so bad. If you think, if you think, you know, re, uh, religious intolerance uh, was bad, is bad now between the Muslims and the Christians? Yeah, try this. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, no, that's not, that's not, that's just bad. Some facts about him. I got to find the section where he's explaining. Um, okay, so um, you don't have to read that section either about the beginning. Just, um, you know, give some historical context. That's interesting. Okay, this is the part I wanted to read to you because it's the person who translated it, but it's what his agenda in translating it, okay? He says, good reader, the great Arabian imposter, now at last, after a thousand years, is by, in, is by way of France, arrived in England, and his Koran, or, you know, book of errors, a brat as deformed as the parent and as full of heresies as his scald head was full of scruffle, hath learned to speak English, right? It's been translated into English. I suppose this piece is exposed by the translator to the public view, no otherwise than some monster brought out of Africa for people to gaze, not to dote upon, as the sight of a monster or a misshapen creature should induce the beholder to praise God who hath not made him such, thank God I'm not like this. So should the readings of the Al-Quran excite us both to bless God's goodness toward us who enjoy the glorious light of the gospel. Of course, we are superior and behold the truth in the beauty of holiness, who suffers so many contraries to be blinded and enslaved with this misshapen issue of Mohammed's brain, being brought forth by the help of no other midwifery than of a Jew and an historian, making use of a tame pigeon, which he had taught to pick corn out of his ears instead of the Holy Ghost and causing silly people to believe that in his falling sickness, he had conference with the angel Gabriel. Okay, guys. Okay, a tribute to religious intolerance. Yeah, okay. That's why I think you should unite reason and faith, right? Um, anyway, you don't have to read any of that stuff at the beginning. Um, I would say just eyeball it a little bit, look at where I have underlined it, um, and I will read a few sections. Um, but there on page, the 11th page on page 34, he talks about the night of power. And we had that in the book. That was when Muhammad, you know, had his first revelation from the um, angel Gabriel. Then on page 37 in the original book about gratitude, how ungrateful he is, right? So gratitude, the word infidel means ungrateful. Um, so, um, all right, so this one is about, um, all right. What other things do I want to um, to direct you to? A revelation um, that has been revealed to him, right? So he's just talking about his revelation. Um, okay. 
Let's see, proposition. There's the, um, the call to prayer, right? He's always um, worship God. I think the Christian liturgy that I grew up with always start out church service. Um, then he's, these stories have been prefixed. Um, a passage which chides, chides the Meccans for their slowness to believe. And um, and then introduces the story. So in Mecca, the people were too corrupt to actually turn around. Oh, here, here's the thing. When the Lord summoned Moses saying, go, you know, go and uh, set my people free, right? And Moses said, no, no, I'm not a good speaker. Go send my brother. So <laughs> I knew that story from the Old Testament. I could not believe it. There it is right in the Quran. Um, okay. People of Noah, right? So now we have Noah, the story of Abraham. Um, and he goes through so many of the Old Testament characters. Um, Okay, Say, uh, save those who believe and work righteous works, make much mention of Allah, and he who makes their defense after they've been wronged, also those who do wrong will know with what I am upsetting they, they will be, what an upsetting they will be upset. Okay, so I think that's just standard stuff about... Um, Okay, there's rewards and punishments. Um, let's see, I had, oh, this is the longer version, I'm sorry. Um, now, those among you, your women who commit whoredom against them, bring as witnesses four from among you. And if that they testify to the whoredom, shut the women up in the houses till death take them. Okay, so you, if you can get four people to testify against a woman, well, that was, I mean, that sounds pretty awful, brutal because of what men do. But at the time, it was really progressive because it meant you couldn't just accuse your wife in order to get rid of her, which is really what was going on. So he says, you have to have four witnesses, right? So four people who will testify in court. Um, so that, that was progressive. Then the women have a right to a share of what the parents and kinfolk leave. That was progressive. The males have the same as two females. Um, and that's huge, you know, over time that women can have property. day of resurrection this has a resurrection story in it there's a section where jesus truly we killed the messiah whereas they did not kill him they did not crucify him okay so you know the quran says that jesus is not the messiah so that's where they disagree um Let's see. Okay, so I guess that's, there is a section there where he talks about the Jews, the Jews. Um, so if you want to use these books to create all sorts of animosity between Jews, Christians, and Muslims, you can, but there aren't a lot of quotes. <laughs> And the other, you know, 173 quotes where God is merciful. I think it really is not the spirit of the Quran, right? It's the letter of the law versus the spirit of the Quran. And um, the, the teachings are about virtue. So here is, here are the articles. These are important. 
the meanings of the Quran. Uh, what is it? Yeah. So try that little quiz. And um, that's why scholars, scholarship is good. Somebody should get paid to be the scholar that can pass down the knowledge, right? What's really going on? Um, oh dear. So I'm going to have to get the, I will attach the other set of articles that has Cuckoo in Carolina. It has about how these freshmen were asked to read this book about the Quran. It wasn't even the Quran. And a conservative religious group took them to court. So um, I will hold your feet to the fire on that one. And then we will do uh, Islam on women. So you have to read the Reigns book. Oh, here's the news. And I will also, and you also need to read that article about Purda, which is sexual segregation. And then I have the outline here. And so the paper is about um, how it violates the United Nations. So what it is, it's a very systematic way to separate men and women um, and why it exists. And then it violates the United Nations Charter. And of course, you know, they don't care. But, you know, if you have a certain step, at least you can say that, right? You can say, insofar as people will agree that the United Nations, those are international rights, then women should be protected and PERDA as an institution, right? To institutionalize it, to mandate it, to put it in your laws is, is inconsistent, incompatible with the United Nations. So there are many Muslim countries that have signed on with the United Nations. Um, and then Indonesia that has the most moderate Muslims would never institutionalize PERDA. So that's, that's important. It's important to know that uh, Islam has had that tradition but most countries now, very rarely does it still occur. If it occurs, it would be in very remote rural areas. Um, but on the other hand, you know, Saudi Arabia has some very heavy handed um, laws and expectations of women. It was only recently they were allowed to drive. Um, so, you know, it matters. And Saudi Arabia has a lot of Wahhabi Muslims. Wahhabi Muslims are extremely radical. <laughs> they aren't terrorists, they aren't Taliban, but they are teaching many, many, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of children to dislike the West at best. And, um, you know, that's, they are not our friend. And, I'm sorry, but Mr. Trump befriended the head of Saudi Arabia. One of, the, one of the people who worked for him is just now under indictment for the way that he, he listened to the Saudis, he negotiated, he, they told him what they wanted Trump to do. He, he instigated that. I mean, the Saudis, are, they can be our, you know, we can negotiate them on, with them against Iran. We have certain things in common, but that's very different from embracing a country. And of course, the reason Trump embraces is that he does business with the Saudis because they're rich and a lot of his friends do. So, I mean, that's a very classic case of how our economic system and greed is corrupting our political system and our diplomatic relationships with other countries. So I do think you need to keep that in mind and you, keep, you do need to know about some of that stuff. Um, okay, so here's, this stuff is important. This is, this is my main thing, is the scholarship, that, that there is a section in the, in the Quran that says, kill the infidels, blah, blah. But that particular surya, that particular section 
was very specifically targeted toward a very specific historical moment and a very specific place and time. Okay. So when you pull a quote out of context, and that happens with the Bible a lot. So we have to differentiate between the religion and state politics. Ha! Huh. <laughs> we have to do that in America too. And Europe, I mean, our founders knew if you want a democracy, you have to do that. If you don't differentiate between those, you are not going to have a democracy. Um, okay, so, uh, all right. So this is just all about the, on one side of the discussion is mostly secular intellectuals horrified by the way Islam is being distorted by the terrorists. On the other side, you know, are powerful religious institutions that use these quotes to justify all sorts of awful stuff, right? Uh, holy war. Um, all right, so in this, this article was written uh, 2004, right? Uh, not long after 2009-11. And um, it's still unfolding. We just don't hear that much about it anymore, which is too bad. But there's a lot of good points in this article. Then um, another, another writer is talking about how she feels as an American. There are 3.3 million uh, Muslims in the United States and they're Muslim American, right? They're citizens. And it's, it's just crazy. Before 9-11, they were extremely patriotic because they came from more authoritarian societies and they have this freedom in the US and, and they love the US, they were not, you know, but after 9-11, they feel so marginalized. I just worry that teenagers, right? When teenagers, especially boys, sorry, testosterone, if they start feeling like they're despised just for being Muslim, they will lash out more. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't think we do ourselves a favor by being that anti-Muslim because we have a lot of Muslim citizens. Um, when Trump first became president, again, this is if, you know, whatever president would do this, I would disagree with. It just happens to be that one. He um, said that there can be no immigrants, nobody coming from seven Muslim countries um, because of terrorism, the threat of terrorism. And so that, you know, went over really big with his political party and his followers. But if you look how many terrorists came from those seven countries, right? How many people? Zero. Where did the terrorists who, who committed the 9-11, where did they come from? Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Saudi Arabia is our friend because they have oil and they do deals with wealthy businessmen who give money to political campaigns. So again, our politics is getting corrupted by money big time. So the terrorist attacks that we have outside of 9-11, the vast majority of them are homegrown, right? <laughs> They're citizens, they grew up here and they, you know, they didn't commit acts of terror before 9-11. And so we really have to be careful about how we deal with Islam. We just have to be patient with complexity and ambiguity. That's the main thing. Um, here's another perspective. Um, Jazeera, oh, you know, if you want a news station that will give you a more objective point of view, I mean, you can try public radio, public TV, but Al Jazeera is pretty amazing. Um, 
at least it used to be. I was in Indonesia and I was in the hospital for a while because I'm allergic to dust. <laughs> um, but I listened to Al Jazeera and I listened to CNN World and BBC World. And that just gives you such a different perspective. Um, it's global. So um, the United Nations, United States news is only 7% international. And most of that is about our troops and how they're doing. We just don't have any, we do not think globally at all. And um, so this is about how we can be influential. It's very important um, how we stand in the rest of the world. And this was a while ago. It, to win, you must understand the world you're in, right? And um, I think that's important. And I think our founders definitely would have thought that's important. Obviously, they knew about Confucius. They even promoted Confucius. They were really broad-minded and open-minded because that was part of preserving democracy. Now, this is the one that's really amazing. So, um, Chap University, North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So they had this summer reading assignment, which to read about the Quran. Hours before these talks were going to begin, there was a lawsuit from a conservative Christian group that had sued to stop them, right? Um, and just right before the, the district court uh, threw out the lawsuit. <laughs> Okay, because it claimed that it was forced Islamic indoctrination. Okay, guys, do you, I am actually making you read the Quran. Ah, does that mean I'm forced Islamic indoctrination? Well, I think, I don't know, you decide. I tell you what I like and what I don't like about some things, right? Not everything, but here we go. So, um. So just check this out. And I and I do want each of you to give maybe two reactions of this article because I really should. <laughs> it really should punch some buttons. Um, the students said that the debate had been overblown, right? And um, they were, even though they were opposed to the assignment, they were glad to have read the book. Uh, actually, they objected to it because they thought it was boring. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a college student for you. It's just so dang boring. It's not like I'm going to become Muslim. The fact is we're at a liberal arts school and it's supposed to open our minds. Hello, you're supposed to get a new perspective. Bravo. Okay. <laughs> um, they were surprised to find parallels between Islam and Christianity. I thought it was going to be some off the wall religion. Ah, uh, really? That's why you read the book. Um, well, okay. Then the big issue is whether it provided a complete picture, right? It didn't include the Islamic notion of holy war. And you could even say that about um, Houston Smith's presentation. But it's true of all the ways he presents these religions. He doesn't look at the dark side, okay? Um, uh, then this uh, other student, I don't believe intolerance of other religions is the guide that Christ set before us to follow, right? He wanted us to show that he was the way, but not through ignorance and intolerance. Uh, reading books like this is a good way to make people more open-minded, okay? So then there's an editorial by Mr. Friedman. Um, and he said, you know, the whole thing is such a lack of understanding of what America is about, right? And it exhibits such a chilling mimicry of what the repressive Arab Muslim states are about. I mean, what would Osama bin Laden do if he found out the university in Saudi Arabia had asked the freshmen to read the New and Old Testaments? <laughs> oh, wow, right? He would do exactly what the book-burning opponents of this directive are doing, shut it down. 
Only he wouldn't bother about courts, right? We don't live, he wouldn't live according to the rule of law. Um, the problem with the world today is not that American students are being asked the, to read the Quran, it's that the students in Saudi Arabia and other Muslim countries are not being asked to read the sacred texts of other civilization, let alone the foundational texts of American democracy, the Bill of Rights. Constitution of the Federalist Papers. In other words, they don't even know what democracy is, right? They don't know the basic building blocks of a democracy. Um, the fact that they ignore such diverse texts is a source of their weakness. And the fact that we embrace them is a source of our strength. Well, so of course I agree with this. <laughs> um, all right, the freedom of thought and the multiple cultural and political perspectives we offer in our public schools are what nurture a critical mind. And a critical mind is the root of innovation, scientific inquiry and entrepreneurship. Um, okay, so that's a monolithic framework does not create a critical mind. So I do want you guys to just get on a soapbox, you know? Yeah, Dr. Beck, this is, <laughs> yeah, we know. Anyway, um, so I look forward to hearing from you and seeing what you decided after you read all this stuff. And I know it's hard, but you signed up for it, so that's it. <laughs>